You're writer as well as director, so what was the inspiration for the story? Yeah, um, so, I mean, usually everyone's asking me if it's autobiographical, and it's not literally something that happened to me. You know, it's more like an emotional autobiography. Uh, in terms of the inspiration, I, I was writing a lot during a period, it was during one of the COVID lockdowns, so just to, you know, not go crazy and save a little bit of, you know, the money I was spending on wine, I decided I would write more uh, to compensate for it, and I was reading a lot more as well. And I was reading a short story by the writer Lauren Groff, um, where it was a, about a high school boy who falls in love with a cadaver, just for context. Uh, it's actually a really sweet, lovely, authentic, melancholy, you know, evocation of the teenage experience. But I didn't even like, I, I finished it later, but I couldn't even get past like the halfway point because in one sentence, it just says he goes to his first party, this boy in high school, and suddenly like, a flood of memories to the one party I went in high school came back at me. Um, and, you know, just like this really vivid sense of the, the kid I was at the time and what I thought the world was like and how, you know, I was pretty absent from myself and from my life in high school. I felt like the teenage years were just like the, the waiting room and, you know, life was going to happen for me from university onwards. Um, so I kind of like, Thinking about it, felt like I was reliving it a little bit, and then having glimmers of uh, you know ideas of things I was going to write one day, and I never did. And eventually, the you know there was two guys were talking in a car, and all this dialogue was flying at me. And I ran. It was like 2 a.m. by the way. I <laughs> rushed out of bed straight onto the laptop and just kind of tried to you know keep up um, with the words as they were coming to me, and just try to type as fast as I could. And you know, um, my husband woke up at 8 a.m. and he's like, what are you doing in your underpants on the laptop? And I was like, oh, I've been writing. And um, like 65% of the script was written in that one night. Um, and it turned into this, basically. That's amazing. <laughs> it's insane. I feel like what happens in this is a, is a particularly gay thing. Where... <laughs> I am a particularly gay thing. So. I, I am too. Um, where you sort of like live in this isolation that you don't really understand and then you discover another person, but always in your story that person can't stay around. <laughs> right? So you just hang around longing for them for the longest time. That's. But I'm just wondering if... if if it is in particular a gay coming of age story. I think there is a sense that like, there's a special kind of loneliness that you experience as a queer kid in a place where there aren't any others. And you know, I was, uh, so it's not my, I was openly queer, gay in my final year of high school. And I partly came out because I was like, someone else is gonna, you know, at least secretly tell me they're gay. And I was waiting for that. And it never happened. To this day, there's no one from my whole high school that I know of who, you know, was, and, you know, statistics would say there's someone, but, like, I never met that person. They, no one, like, I spoke to... What year did you graduate? Kids. Sorry? What year did you graduate? 2003, I graduated. Oh. Um, but, no, there is a special kind of loneliness when you think you are the, you know, only one. And, you know, it wasn't... Because um, I was pretty, like, you know, in myself, like, I never experienced the guilt or the shame or those things. I think I was safely in denial whenever, I, you know, I had an internalized homophobia. By the time I realized I was gay, I was very much out and proud to myself. But, um, so it was kind of, I don't know, a fun thing, realizing it was queer in some way. But uh, there was a loneliness that came with it. And I think that that is experienced very commonly with a lot of queer kids, especially in kind of more kind of, you know, limited <laughs> surroundings. Um, I do think that's a loneliness other people can relate to, and like the amount of people who come to me at the end of a screening, uh, crying, going, "How did you know my life story?" Who are straight women, you know, like, and a lot of gay men, obviously as well. But uh, so I'm really happy about that that it can connect to other people who aren't, you know, like me on the surface. But yeah, I, I do think the queer experience comes with a certain kind of loneliness that it was the driving force, you know, behind this. And you know, um, everyone's always 
the other question I get, how did you make this film after you weren't be alone, which by the way is about 19th century Macedonian witches and it's all like woozy and voiceover -y. So If you haven't seen it, it's effing amazing. <laughs> Thank you. But it's very different uh, on the surface. But I'm like, you could call this film You Won't Be Alone just as comfortably and the title would fit. So yeah, I, th I think you're very much onto something when <laughs> you say that. So let's talk about your actors. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Who are also effing amazing. How did you find these three? Oh, um, it was uh, arduous. <laughs> the casting process wasn't very conventional um, in the sense that um, they kind of very much fit what I was looking for, but it was difficult to convey to other people that this was it. Um, and uh, like Elias didn't come through until like the third or fourth shortlist, by which point my casting agent was just like frantically panicking and just throwing anyone who looks remotely like me you know, <laughs> into the shortlist. And I was like, that was the first time, you know, I saw someone with feeling in their eyes that, you know, spoke to me of life experience that, that I understood, that I kind of in, 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 intensely and innately connected with. Um, and he, he looks nothing like what was written, technically speaking, um, physically, but like, and, and that was kind of also the thing, like I was like, he has to be in the movie somehow. And I sort of was, um, couldn't find another role. And then I was looking at it and, and going, okay, envision the film with this face and this eyes and this voice, you know, doing the story. And what do you think about the film? And I was much more interested in that version rather than what I wrote. Um, with Tom Green, it was different in the sense that, uh, like, irrespective of the casting process, I kind of dug up like every showreel by every male actor in Australia under the age of like 40. Um, and I came across a clip of him in the film called um, I'm Having a Black, uh, Down River. Um, and it was, I mean, there was a few, but there was one that was very simple, and it was just him walking into a cafe, and there was just this sense of like magnetism you know, purely as an actor, but also it felt like I was watching a, someone being a person rather than trying to show me something, just someone inhabiting a, a personality. Um, and coincidentally, he had just sent his audition tape like that hour, because um, I desperately emailed my casting agent to contact him, and she's like, well, here he is. And, you know, like his first re read through was already like spot on. There was no direction <laughs> necessary. And yeah, Hattie uh, was in the first round that was shown to me. I think like several hundred girls audition and it was like 30 that I got to see. Um, and that was the only one I ever got for a callback. Um, and again, it felt spot on. I, I didn't have as vivid a picture physically of what Ebony would look like. I, I mean, I think she was blonder in my head, maybe in a vague. Uh, but that was about the only difference because essentially just like I was looking for a voice and like a, a particular speed and energy and kind of like be someone who's really alive and vivid. Right. And yeah. Um, these three are amazing because of the intensity of the relationships in this movie. Uh, I'm just wondering for, for each of you, can you talk about how you found that with each other? Um, did you guys have a rehearsal time, very much rehearsal time together? Um, yeah. No. <laughs> nope. Okay. No, we didn't rehearse uh, a whole lot at all. Um, Goran doesn't work that way. Uh, he likes it just to feel natural on screen and um, it generally works that way when it's the first time performing it. Um, so we'd go through the, the direction, of course, and understand our, our circumstances and everything, but a lot of it was just just let the camera roll. So, yeah. I think like the first time I met Elias, we went and had a, a burger, didn't we? Yeah. We had a, we had a burger in, in... The second in, and the third and the most and the, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we went and sat down and had a burger in Richmond in, in, um, in Melbourne, and we just talked about it. Um, but yeah, after that it was like coffees and just going through the script like play by play. And there wasn't a lot of rehearsing, which is apart from the dance that was rehearsed. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it, it's, you know, it's scary, like not rehearsing, but at the same time, after a while you, you forget all about it. So, but, um, and I think that that intensity actually comes from that, you know, because you're shit scared. Like you are, no, you're fucking shit scared because they, Goran will just be like, where do you want to start? And you're like, maybe here, do it, roll. And you're like, all right. 
So you're vaping, trying to get that nicotine hit beforehand, you know. I think it just all helps. Yeah, I think we just got really lucky. I think from the first moment in the chemistry read, we all just clicked. Um, and it just felt right and we bounced off each other really well. Um, which is really important because I think a lot of the film rests on our chemistry with each other, particularly with these two. Um, so, yeah, I think it was just lucky. And we hung out quite a bit during pre-production. Goran took us around to all the real-life locations one day. Um, yeah, we were all yeah, together in a really things, hot, right? <laughs> sweaty car. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we didn't have any rehearsals, but we spent a bit well, of time together. I think together this is the thing. I think what people call a rehearsal, like, is... Uh, to me, rehearsing is just sitting and talking about anything, like spending time together, purely connecting as people, and then you can talk about the story. But like, I don't do read-throughs, I guess. Yeah, and you don't we block don't either. Lines. But to me, rehearsing is sitting in a space and talking and connecting because the chemistry happens from that, not from like be, um, acting out the same lines over and over again, yeah. I feel. so. Yeah. How did you convey to Hattie that Ebony needed to be the worst... Capital W O R S T. I, I said she's the epi you are the epitome of the worst in this. <laughs> but I loved it Sorry. so much. I just told her, just think you're playing me. <laughs> Action. <laughs> what was so great is I could I could just picture that over the years how many times she had done this, and that Cole had to like rescue her from someplace in the suburbs of Melbourne. Um, yeah, they, they were so uh, specific. I think each of you were so specific. I appreciated your work. I just, when I watch that, I'm just like, I don't understand how that's accomplished, but I assume it's because you're really great actors and you're a really great director who loves to work with actors. Oh, let's not go crazy. Um, <laughs> no, they're pretty good, but... Um, <laughs> they're all right. No, but I think the other thing is also like them as I, I'm very much a believer in kind of adjusting the character to the actor rather than the actor to the character, and not because of like skill set or whatever. Like they could do the role as written. That, that was not, we have that, we have that footage, um, but I I think uh, when you when you you know. Uh, there's things that you can't write or imagine in advance. So when you meet someone, there's an energy or like essences to them that like you'd be crazy to just go, no, let's do the script. Um, uh, it's like I want to capture and preserve that personality for what it is in itself, and then it kind of you know meshes with what's written. Um, and also, but also like they were encouraged to improvise quite a lot, uh, and not, you know not all of that made it on screen, but sometimes. The, the looks and gestures along the way in between the improv, like there was a dynamic that built up and those yeah. are the moments you preserve, but also the, a lot of it is improvised. But when they're like oh, busy checking gonna, yeah. each other out in the car and she's on the phone in the background yelling at her mother, she literally invented that entire monologue. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, was written. okay, yeah, that's my next question was gonna be, is everything as scripted or did you allow them to sort of play with some improv in that too? It's quite a lot of improv, I yeah. think, even in the finished film, right? Yeah. There was. Actually, can I just say, there was one, I think one of the first days Hattie was on set, um, we hadn't actually had, I hadn't had any scenes with her, and I came on set and she was doing the phone booth scene, and um, I was behind the screen watching, and then I think it was the second take, and it, I was listening and it was completely different, and I grabbed Christine and I was like, is this, and I'm looking at the sides and I'm like, this isn't, what is she doing? And she's like, oh, she's, she's, she's improvising the entire thing. <laughs> and she was going, fuck. All right. Was this the call she makes to the mom, uh, no, or the no, call that, she makes to Cole? That was the call to him, like the opening sequence. Yeah. Uh, if you put Hattie in a phone booth, magic comes out one way or another. <laughs> I thrive in a phone booth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we had to teach her how you use a phone because she was born in two thousand and two, I believe. <laughs> I was gonna say. Yeah, there was a lot that was confronting you about directing crazy? someone born in 2002. It's crazy there's a few generations of people that don't know how to use a dial phone now or oh a handset phone. Yeah, or recognize the references that you've written into the film because they're from the 90s, which is or again, know it. before they were born. It's yeah. yeah. It's that was most of the direction, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder for the three of you... Um, did you relate to the story in the script when you were there, things in it 
that did you sort of feel like it was a universal story as well that we were talking about the love story in it? Well, with my character in particular, I did relate to a lot of the vulnerability. I was a fairly shy kid as in, in school. So, um, yeah, I played to that quite well, I think. But, yeah, that's, that's how I was able to, to relate. I mean, I definitely have never read Borges or Kafka. I tried to, actually. I actually did try. Um, and I feel like I'm cold in that sense. I tried. I had no idea what was going on. But the... Um, I definitely felt the the you know the scene where they have to say goodbye to each other. I've been through that um, twice, so that really like struck a chord, um, big time. Yeah. Yeah, I was really moved by the script the first time I read it. Um, I think the themes are so universal. Um, you know, kind of first love and right person, wrong time, and wanting to escape like the place you grow up in. Um, so I related to all of that stuff. And then with Ebony, hopefully I didn't relate too much <laughs> to her. She's a bit of a cow. Um, but I've, I've, I've met multiple people like her, you know, growing up. Like, she just lived in me through observation. Um, <coughs> what I really loved, though, is that I believed you and Cole's relationship when he said, you know, when, when you say, I think you need to get away from Ebony. <laughs> He's like, no, I love her. And I believed him, and I believe that, that you loved him as well. So that's what I loved about it. Is it, was, it was a genuine love on their part. <clears throat> so your, your tagline says, all we have is now. Um, but, you know, at the end, Cole's saying he, he basically, like, time stopped on the day that that he met Adam and he felt like he hasn't advanced and he isn't living in the moment anymore. Um, was that always your choice? Was this always your choice for the ending? And um, what are your, do, do any of you sort of have feelings around what's next for Cole? Um, yeah, the ending was always what's written. Um, pretty much, we shot the first draft. Uh, there was very little variation. So, um, in terms of everything that happens, it's quite close to what I conceived. Um, oh, you know, taglines are things that fit on a poster, and I really don't like it when you summarize a film in just words. Because I never find—I mean, when I have to do it, because I never feel it. You know, I think if it's something that you can phrase in words, you should write a book. I think a movie needs to be a feeling that you, you can kind of communicate through it being a movie and nothing else. Um, but in a literal sense, um, I guess it, it does connect to, uh, like I said, like part, part of writing the movie was about like, because I didn't live in the moment, you know. Um, growing up, I thought life happens where Wong Kar Wai is, you know, or where Ingmar Bergman is, or Catherine Hepburn, you know. I, it didn't happen in my cloud high. And going back to it was like me trying to live it in the present tense uh, because I didn't back in the day. And yeah, there is a sense of all we have is now. And you know, as much as I was trying to relive it, and like it was a beautiful experience and it helped me a lot as well. And I really cherish it. But there's always going to be that regret uh, in me of like I wish I was more present in in the present tense back in the day. Um, and I've learned to be more present now as a result. Um, but yeah. You guys were meant any to feelings about the end? <laughs> Do, any feelings about is is Cole going to remain stuck in time? Is he going to unstick himself? I haven't really thought about it. I don't think I want to tell people. <laughs> I think I want to keep it a secret. Yeah, I don't think I've, I don't actually think I've considered it either. I think when we're shooting it, like you may have fleeting thoughts about it, but never want to hang on to those. You know, I kind of like walking away from it and just sort of letting it air. Um, and hopefully, like, in the audience watching it, it should feel that way too. I kind of like that. Several people have begged me not to make a sequel, which I'm just, like, flattered that anyone assumes someone would throw money at me to make a sequel anytime soon. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> me not make a movie is a favor. Amazing. Um, but I, I do think I, I appreciate that sense of... I, I, I think it would wreck it if, if we kind of 
destroy that ambiguity of that ending. Because I, I mean, I, I definitely see it in a very concrete way, and I have a feeling of what's going to happen next. Other people have a different version, um, and I think that's something really special, and I don't really want to let go of it. Um, because when I was writing it originally, I did have a sense of, uh, you know, the Antoine Duanel or the bef uh, before films of like revisiting these characters every ten years because I love them deeply and I love these kids, you know, the real life versions deeply as well. But I, th I think every time I, I, d I thought I'd rather just write a different script that they could be in. I think it's, it's, I, I would love it if people are dying to find out what happens next. But I prefer people to want more rather than less than what you've shown them. So yeah. I'd keep it to that. I liked the ending. I liked that it that it left me thinking about things a lot. That's the kind of ending that I like. So this comes out when. Uh, the 17th of February. 17th. Friday week. And Please tell everybody. <laughs> what's next? What's next for each of you? Uh, I just finished editing the third one. Um, so we're doing sound mix when I fly home uh, next week. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Uh, I haven't slept in two years. <laughs> um, and after that, I have no idea. I might have a lot of spare time if anyone's got any jobs going. So <laughs> Apart from looking for reps over here, I'm just auditioning. I'm going back to a full-time retail job. Same. <laughs> back in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. I've told him to put in a good word for me as well, actually. <laughs> Unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> That's <But> it. <laughs> Wait, I think we're doing a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Y'all are incredibly fabulous in this and thank you for collaborating collaborating this is one of already one of my favorite films of this year so thank you so much thank you thank, so much. thank you for coming to talk to us thank you thank you thanks everyone <laughs>